Good morning, everyone. We are here. We are live. Good, good, good. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, one of the things that's made me the most money in poker, and that is how to play against maniacs. Maniacs are a lot of fun. For those who don't know what a maniac is, a maniac is someone who typically plays aggressively whenever you show weakness. So... You have to understand though, maniacs come in a few different varieties. Some will essentially always bluff whenever they have the opportunity. So if you check, they will bet, they will raise, they will re-raise, whatever. If you bet, they'll, I mean, basically they just are mindless, right? However, most maniacs today are not actually that mindless. They instead try to pounce on what they perceive to be weakness. So what is weakness? Well. You have to understand, most people at this point in time will raise with a wide range and will continuation bet <clears throat> with a wide range. So the flop, pre-flop raise, and the flop, I'm sorry, the pre-flop raise and the flop continuation bet are not actually indicators of strength or weakness. But on the turn, usually a lot of people play very straightforwardly. They bet with their best hands, they check with their worst hands. And if they do that, they will get demolished because they're going to be folding way too often when they check and when they bet the maniacs get to just fold right and this isn't even what maniacs do this is just what decent players do they're going to call your flop pre-flop raise or pre-flop raise they're going to call your flop bet they're going to see what you do on the turn and then they're going to play reasonably well and you want to make sure that does not happen to you right because they're going to crush you so that's like decent maniacs and like i said there are some maniacs who are just really bad who will just always re-raise pre-flop always four bet pre-flop always um raise flop continuation bets etc 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 oh i hear my baby crying let me go see him james be good be good one second Oh, the joys of being a parent, huh? The, lo the stroller is not functioning properly. Okay, anyway, back to maniacs. So say they're digging my poker coaching polo. It's a little bit wrinkly, that's okay. Um, back to maniacs. If your opponents are ap actually maniacs, which I think is something that does give a lot of people a lot of problems, there are very easy ways to beat these players. I discussed this in my very first book. Where is it? Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1. The idea of controlling the size of the pot. Essentially, anytime you have a hand that is not a premium made hand, checking is reasonable, especially if your opponent will bluff if you check to them, or think that your range is much weaker than it actually is if you check to them. So, easy example of this is say you raise with King Jack, Button calls, flop comes, king, seven, three. You continuation bet like you would with your whole range. They call. On the turn, you can check with your king jack there because what's going to happen is they will then assume your check indicates a hand worse than a king. Therefore, they're going to try to bluff you on the turn in the river. So you check, call, turn, you check, call, river, pretty much no matter how it runs out, and you print money. Sometimes you can get outdrawn. Sometimes you're not going to get outdrawn. Usually you're not, and you're going to end up winning like 80% of these pots because your opponent's going to think your range is much weaker than it is, and they're going to pounce if they are generally loose and aggressive. And now people are starting to realize that checking does not necessarily indicate weakness. You have to understand, a long time ago, people really did play super straightforwardly. They would bet when they had a good hand, they would check when they didn't. Now people know you have to check with some of your good hands just because that's good poker, right? So, my coffee's like way over here this morning. Let's put it right in front of us. How to play against maniacs. Well, if you have position on the Maniac, life is usually pretty easy because they're going to raise too wide. You're going to call in position with a lot of stuff, right? You're going to make a pair. They're going to bet, and you're just not going to fold. You're going to call flop, call turn, call river with something like middle pair and better. Um, again, this goes back to you have to figure out how maniacal your opponent is. Some people will be crazy on the flop and the turn, but be relatively straightforward on the river, right? Against those players, calling river bets is... Not such a good idea because they're going to have a relatively strong river range when they do bet, right? Um, but if 
you are against a legitimate maniac, which I think is what most of your all questions are about, the, the questions that were sent in to me. Um, if you are against a legitimate maniac, then you need to just call, 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 and they're going to be bluffing, I don't know, 60% of the time, and your minimum defense frequency, if they're potting it, is 33%. 33%? No, half, 50%. So you need to call half of the time. They're going to be bluffing. like You're going to be good like 30, 30, 60% of the time, and you only need to be good 33% due to your uh, pot odds. There we go. Pot odds is the right word. Somehow it's... Words are escaping me this morning. Speaking of words escaping me, I'm going to be doing a webinar tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I forgot about this. Um, we're actually going to be discussing how to play against maniacs. So if you're not signed up for that, you need to. It's completely free. If you're on my email list, you got an invitation for it already. If you did not get your invitation, you need to send me an email to make sure that you got it. Um, just click reply to any email that I've sent you. If you're not on my email list, go get on it. Just go to jonathanlillipoker.com, enter your email, you'll be on it. Um, go to pokercoaching.com, get your free trial, you'll be on it. We're gonna be going over an interesting question, right? We're gonna discuss this exact situation, okay? Everyone folds to you on the button with a 100 big blind effective stack early in a $500 tournament. The players in the blinds are both overly aggressive and maniacal, okay? Sound familiar? What's your strategy? You have to tell me which hands you're gonna raise your whole range with. Let's say you raise the two and a half big blinds and the big blind calls. Flop comes jack seven six, no flush draw, your opponent checks. What do you do with your whole range? Which hands do you bet? Which hands do you check? Um, say you bet two and a half big blinds and your opponent check raises on jack seven six. This is a spot where a lot of people get in trouble. They have no clue what to do. And I'm going to explain to you how to play every single hand in your range tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. If you're a little bit late, that's okay. Um, but you might as well show up because uh, we'll be there. I'm going to try to do more webinars for you all, I think. Um, it, it's kind of difficult to do uh, webinars where I display full hand ranges because obviously you're looking at me and not my screen, but tonight we'll be looking at my screen and we'll be able to see how to play the whole range. So we get check raised, what do we do? Which hands do we call with? Which hands do we fold? What's your minimum defense frequency right here, right? You have to put in um, how many? 5.5? Yeah, if you put in 5.5 into a pot that's, gosh, I don't know, 20? You need to defend a lot. So in that scenario, you do need to be sticking around. Mark says this is a previous homework question. It is, but we're just going to breeze through it. So um, then, suppose you call. The turn is a two of clubs. Your opponent bets 22 big blinds. What do you do? Suppose you call again. Your opponent jams the river on two of hearts river. What do you do? Right? We're going to be discussing how to play your whole range in all those scenarios at 8 p.m. Eastern time. It'll be a short one-hour webinar, kind of like this, but I think it will be very beneficial for all of you, especially if you are having difficult time having a difficult time dealing with maniacs. Money Pot said, you won two big tournaments, or sideline in two big tournaments. Good. What's my advice on how to prepare? Learn to play well. Sign up to your free trial at PokerCoaching.com. We're also running a New Year sale for PokerCoaching.com, for those who are unaware. Go to PokerCoaching.com slash New Year. All right, back to Maniacs. If you're in position, just go call, call, call. If you are out of position, you need to do a lot of checking with your strong and medium strength made hands that can easily check call down. Or maybe you make a continuation bet, as they expect you to do. Check, call, turn, check, call, river. Um, what a lot of people do incorrectly is they raise with their best hands. This is the classic, classic recreational player mistake. They will raise a hand like pocket aces. A maniac will call on the button. Flop will come, 973. They'll check, the maniac will bet, and then they'll check raise big. Because they don't want to get outdrawn, I guess. And you do not need to fear being outdrawn. That will happen sometimes. You instead want to make sure you're maximizing value. Whenever you check raise, your opponent's usually only going to continue with good hand, good made hands and good draws. And that just should not be much of their range, right? So instead, you'd rather check call, keep your opponent in with everything, and against everything, you're going to win 70% of the time or so. So would you rather win a big pot 70% of the time or a tiny pot most of the time, right? And by check raising in these spots, you essentially give your, uh, you make your hand a big reverse implied odds hand where usually you're gonna win a little bit or lose a lot. And that's not where you wanna be. And you have to understand most maniacs aren't like, dumb and they're not bad. They are aggressive because it works so well against their opponents, right? If their opponents fold too often, as many small and medium stakes players do, you should be a maniac because they're gonna fold too often. They 
let you know with their bets whether or not they have a good hand, right? So if you check, they think you don't have a good hand, they're going to be blasting you because the vast majority of the player pool folds by the river. Jay says, when you check raise them with pocket aces, you tell them what you have. You do. So, interestingly enough, um, another strategy against maniacs is to bluff them a lot. A lot of people are deathly afraid to bluff the maniacs, but if you pay attention, you'll see that they fold a lot when they get raised. So you can get really out of line and use a really strong exploitative strategy of check calling with all of your good made hands and check raising with all of your draws, especially the bad draws and even just junk. So that's a quite powerful strategy. Really though, there are two main easy ways to take advantage of maniacs. The first one is just play a stronger range, right? It's not fun to sit there and play a little bit tighter, a little bit more cautious, a little bit more passive, but if you just start with way better hands than the maniac, you're gonna crush them. Now, it is worth mentioning, you can be a maniac post-flop, but not a maniac pre-flop, right? Say, um, whenever someone raises and you decide to call, you just decide you're winning almost every pot. Well, you're gonna be bluffing way too much, right? Um, some people are maniacs pre-flop. They'll raise three bet, four bet pre-flop, but then just play straight poorly after the flop. So understand that the term maniac is not a blanket statement you can just apply to one specific type of player. And, and there really are, you need to figure out exactly which tendencies your opponents exhibit. But across the board, the way you beat people who play way too aggressively with too much of their range, which is essentially what a maniac is, is you play a stronger range than pre-flop, or you do a lot more bluffing because their range should be very weak. Now, if your opponent's just a lunatic and they're going to raise, re-raise, go all in with like four high, they don't care. Well, now you just need to play decent hands and, and play them aggressively, right? Like say you have king, queen and flop comes king, seven, three. Say you have ace, seven, flop comes ace, seven, three. Uh, you bet they raise you. You can re-raise. If they're going to jam with literally every gut shot, queen, jack, stuff like that, you're thrilled to get it in with the ace, seven. So... In those scenarios against absolute lunatics, you can just get your money in happily. But that's usually not going to be the case. Let's see. Yasa says he's played the big stack tournaments of parks before. They're usually very rebuy heavy with a good amount of maniacs firing bullets early. Yeah, that's definitely something that will, will occur in re-entry tournaments or rebuy tournaments. A lot of people are not afraid of blasting their money in. So keep that in mind. And um, some people think that... If people are rebuying a lot, that hurts your chances to win or something like that, but that's absolutely not true. Everyone has roughly the same amount to win on each bullet. If you sit there and just play good cards, you're going to crush them. I remember um, on Poker Stars a long time ago, they would have a $10 and also a $100 re-entry tournament, a rebuy tournament. And the way it works is if you busted, you could rebuy and stay at the same table. So the good players thought it would be a good idea. This is the good players. Some of the good players thought it would be a good idea to just go all in blind every single hand until you get to like 15 buy-ins or flood your table with chips. And that's a decent idea if you know you're gonna be at your table for a long time as you may in live poker. Like I know Daniel Negron who's mentioned he's done this a few times. I know Lane Flack did this a few times where they'll be all they'll be in for like 50 buy-ins, but their table has now 70 or 80 buy-ins. They know they're gonna be there all day because they know the breaking order. And now they're gonna be a good player playing 300 big blinds deep for a long time against very bad players, presumably very bad players. And they're gonna get all the chips a lot of the time. It's a little bit uh, risky to be playing a tournament for 50 buy-ins, though, because you have to take, like, third place, and there's no guarantee you're going to take third place or better. Um, but anyway, back then, I was not one of the lunatics blasting it in. I would just sit there and play really tightly. I knew my opponents were jamming any two cards. I would just make a standard raise with, like, the top 10% of hands, and then call it off. And you're going to get all your money in every single time, and you're going to be 60-ish or 65% to win. And you're going to crush them. Kevin says, you played the bubble horribly the other day, but you couldn't come to there without my help. Well, I'm sorry I didn't help you with the bubble more. All right. Zach says, the other day in 1-2, you had about 300 in front of you. Bill has 600, which does not matter. All that matters is the effective stack. You're in the big blind. Everyone limps. You check 8-6 suited. It comes 9-9-7. You bet 15. Everyone folds to the villain who makes it 60. I would definitely not lead this board. This is a board where you want to check raise. When you lead, that lets people call with all sorts of gut shots, overcards, sevens. When you check raise, it's going to put them in a way worse spot. And this is a board where your opponent should be betting with some draws if you check. So I would definitely check raise flop. Anyway, you decided to lead. You get raised. Uh, your opponent is... You don't say if he's a maniac or not. You should probably just fold. You say he makes a 60, so you know he has a 9. Easy fold, then. If you know he has a 9, you have an easy fold. 
Because you don't know if he has a 10-9. All right. Ben says, how do you know he has a 9? Good question. <laughs> if he's a maniac, how do you know he has a 9? Exactly. If, if, if he's a maniac, obviously he does not have a 9. <laughs> I mean, he, may, he could have a 9, but he could also just have um, Jack-10, right? 10-8. Stuff like that. Very aggressive players got lots of experience. Take their hands like ace queen and play them way too aggressively when they miss. So Kevin, that's sort of what, what I was referring to where not even like loose players, but players who open from middle position with a decently wide range, the flop comes and they have like ace queen, ace jack, ace king, and they miss. They just bet flop, bet turn and jam river because they think it's a good hand because ace king is a good hand pre-flop. But obviously it's not a good hand on nine, seven, six, four, two, right? You saw the mother of all maniacs the other day. Good. Got lucky every time and got called. Good. After 50 games, you got, you got moved to another table. Bad beat. You have to understand, whenever um, the Maniac is hitting, whenever the Maniac is connecting well with the board, a lot of people think something to the effect of, oh, I need to avoid that player because they're getting lucky. But that is ridiculous. That is asinine. You um, are thrilled when that's the case. What's a good bankroll for a small stakes player? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Everyone is saying uh, Maniacs don't have the 9 when they check raise on 997. They could have the 9. That's the thing about Maniacs, right? Is that they will check raise their 9s on 997. They'll also check raise all the draws too, though. And maybe some 7s and maybe even junk like King Queen or Backdoor Flush Draw with Overcard. And when the Maniac does have the nuts, they're going to get paid. You're going to pay them. And that's okay. It's okay. If you, um, if your opponents will make egregious mistakes with all of their garbage, but they will get paid off with their good hands. That's okay because they're only going to have a good hand like 15 or 20% of the time. So 80% of the time you win, 20% of the time you lose. That's a good deal. And sometimes you're going to play against these players and they're going to have the nuts five or 10 times in a row. They're just going to get paid and paid and paid and paid. And that's okay. Should you open up your range a little bit against the maniac? Um, typically, no. If you do open up your range, you need to make sure that you defend even uh, more than you normally would. And the issue and the problem with playing against Maniacs is they make you fold close to the minimum defense frequency just by naturally betting often, and it puts you in tough spots. So an easy way to not be in tough spots is to just start with a better range. That way you can easily call down. I mean, they need, they need you to fold something like 33% of the time or 50% of the time on every street, and if you just defend way more than that, you're going to demolish them. All you have to do is structure your range to where you don't fold as often as they will. They make money because you fold too much. So don't fold as often, right? And you do that by having your range be way stronger and knowing not to fold it, right? I mean, one of the worst things you can do is like say, I don't know, say, say Maniac raises, you defend ace seven in the big blind, flop comes king seven three. You check, they bet, you call. Turns a queen, you check, they bet, you call. River's a four or whatever. You check, they bet, it's a pretty easy call. But a lot of players will fold there, and that's a good example of where you just make a gigantic error by folding. And we're going to be discussing this tonight, by the way, in this webinar. Webinar is going to be at 8 p.m. You need to be on my email list to get it. If you're not on my email list, well, send me an email at support at pokercoaching.com. Say you want to be added to the email list and you want to get in the webinar tonight. It's going to be at 8 p.m. We're going to go through a situation where you get check rates by Maniac on Jack 7-6. And we're going to discuss how to play that specific scenario with your whole range so you all don't have to be guessing. You just know. Let's see. Villain aggressive player under the gun. Hero three bets with queens. Under gun plus one, let's see. Both of them have more 100 than one. So what about the villain who jams? Should you always be calling here if you profile him as a maniac? Yes. You're in a wild home game? Good. Two maniacs to your left. Great. A great spot to be a massive nit. That is accurate. You got my $10 multi-table tournament. I took second place in for 14 k Do you think the content is outdated? Almost certainly not. I haven't gone back and watched it in a little while. I think that was from three or four years ago. But the way you play against bad players doesn't really change that much. Um, the way you play against bad players very often stays somewhat the same because the type of bad player you're going to play against in a $10 tournament with a million people doesn't really change that much. I remember that tournament. I was thinking, man, if I turned 10,000 into a... Uh, I don't even know how many buys this, buys this is. 1,400 to be like getting... Four, is it 14 million? I think it's like getting 14 million. Or is it 1.4 million? Either way... It's my biggest tournament score in terms of buy-ins, and unfortunately it was only in a $10 tournament. I think it's 1.4 million. Not quite as impressive, but uh, that would have been nice. Many players overplay ace-king 
Um, yes, they definitely overplay it. I'm not going to say it's an overrated hand. It's like the third or fourth or fifth best hand, but you can definitely mess it up. What people don't understand is pre-flop ranges, pre-flop strength is irrelevant after the flop. When you have ace king, it comes eight seven four. You have a bluff catcher or a junk, and we're going to be discussing that tonight. Um, like whenever you continuation bet jack seven six with ace king, what do you need to do? If you flop the nut straight, the board has three suited cards. Well, you don't have the nut straight then, do you? And the player bets, and the next player calls, what do you do? Probably just call. Let's see. Been dealing with Maniacs at 510. Are live tells important? Yes, definitely play. I, play. I rely on live tells. And what is ABC poker? This is something that gets a lot of people in trouble. They hear the term ABC poker and think that means weak, tight, straightforward. And one of the things I... Uh, my favorite quote from one of my friends, Dave Benefield, is whenever I was learning, I was struggling to beat 1020 online a long time ago. And he basically said, just play ABC poker. And then he's, he's like, well, to be fair, my ABC poker is probably very different than your ABC poker. And that is accurate, right? He was loose, aggressive, borderline maniacal, very creative. And that was just normal, good, fundamentally sound poker in his mind. A lot of people think ABC poker means weak and tight. And that is not good. Do not be weak and tight. You will get crushed. Unless your opponents are oblivious, right? If your opponents are oblivious, then yeah, play top 5% of hands and just demolish them. You just joined the email list. You need to email support at pokercoaching.com and request to be added to the, the um, webinar. I don't know why you all are, are not on my email list already. If you're not, well, maybe you don't deserve to be in the webinar. But um, if, you, uh, if you email support at pokercoaching.com, ask to be on the email list and um, get access to the webinar tonight at 8 p.m. Plaza said it would have been 14 million. Brutal. <laughs> Can you sign up through the pokercoaching.com on the website? No, this is exclusive to the email list, everyone. You must be on the email list. Ivan says, or I, I have says there were two suited cards on the flop. You definitely want to raise them with your best made hands. With your best made hands, you want to be raising. So against Maniacs, three bet lighter. Maybe if they'll fold a lot. Uh, let's see. You all have lots and lots to say about Maniacs today. You play a solid, balanced approach against players who are obviously making mistakes. But you have, or should, should you play balanced against players who have no identifiable mistakes? Yes. Passive exploitation is ideal. If you don't know what your opponents are doing wrong, just play good, fundamentally sound poker, right? So, uh, yeah, it would have been 10,000 to 14 million. I won more buy ins I would have won playing the main events of the World Series of Poker, but unfortunately, it was only a $10 tournament. Can you join the webinar in progress? I think it's probably going to get capped at 500 people, but um, you can try. Mark says, never thought about it, but ABC poker as a term is pretty vague and is wildly different for different people. That is definitely true. Definitely, definitely, definitely true. My ABC poker, I promise, is very different than a lot of your ABC poker because I know people out there who say, should I just play ABC poker? That means look at my cards. Are they good? Well, if they're good, I bet. If they're not good, I check. That is not good poker. That is awful. Awful poker. Don't yell, Jonathan. Don't yell. That is awful poker. Because your opponents know how to play against you. It's easy. Let's see. In tournaments, it's good to have different gears. I think the idea of different gears is a little bit silly. That takes the that takes into account... You're essentially saying, I need to play differently because of the previous hands I played, or... I think image is so drastically important that I should be significantly adjusting my strategy away from a solid, fundamentally sound strategy. And quite often people just aren't paying attention or like there's no real justification for playing significantly wider preflop. Like sure, you could say I'm using a different gear because I'm gonna check raise on a lot of flops in a scenario, but that's just good poker, right? Dean Nelson says, bad poker makes Jonathan angry. It does. It does make me angry because it's inexcusable. I put out so much content to help you all play well that some of these concepts are inexcusable for you to even consider. But um, the term thinking gears came a long time ago before anyone had any clue what a hand range was. And the idea was if I play tightly for a while, now I get to raise more hands because my opponents think I'm tight. And that is true to some extent. But I think a lot of people take it way too far. Uh, they'll sit there and they'll play like no hands for five hours because they want to be able to change gears later. But if you get like jack 10 suited, you should play it, right? 
if you get king queen, you should play it. You shouldn't just sit there and fold because you I'm playing a tight gear now, right? It doesn't make sense. Let's see. There's a problem paying through PayPal. Good, Patrick. We no longer are doing PayPal. Go to um, pokercoaching.com slash new year and you can sign up using just a credit card. You thought ABC Poker just playing straightforward and didn't stand for anything. Well, exactly. What does straightforward mean? Plaza, if you've studied at PokerCoaching.com, you'll know that my straightforward poker is very different than most people's because we're running bluffs and defending with the minimum defense frequency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? A lot of people straightforward means bet your good hands, check your bad hands. ABC Poker, in my mind, means your default strategy. Play your default strategy. But a lot of people's default strategy is bad. All right. Where would you recommend starting? Which book, if you want to? Play sound poker. Here it is. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. This book, talking about uh, you know, GTO ranges and just playing well. To be fair, this book is not about game theory optimal play. This is about exploiting opponents, but you have to start somewhere, right? And it discusses how to play against all sorts of player types. This is the type of analysis we're going to be doing tonight in the webinar. If you're not signed up, email support at pokercoaching.com. And you'll see, like, on the river, we have all sorts of... Um, Ranges that start to get really small, and that's where you can really crush your opponents if they don't balance their range well. If they don't balance their range well and they have like all nuts on the river, then clearly you'll just demolish them, right? You say play solid like my book suggests. My books generally suggest playing a little bit too loose. You find the donkeys crushing the table. Well, you have to ask what is a donkey and how are they crushing the table? Are they getting lucky? If they're getting lucky, it's irrelevant. If they are playing aggressively and people fold too often to them, well, now they're crushing their opponents because they play poorly. All right, let's see. Maniacs are fun, you're right. So you generally try to isolate in position versus Maniac. I don't really mind going multi-way because multi-way you have to defend even less. So the fact that the if the Maniac's still going to play Maniacal multi-way, then... That's fine, because you don't have to defend nearly as often, so it's now really easy just to call down. All right. Let's see. Just trap in position versus maniacs. Yes, but you don't always get to play in position, and you don't always get a trapping hand. That's the problem. Kevin says he carries around that book everywhere. Good. Louis Fleet says playing for 80 big blinds with queens preflop versus maniac is a good idea, right? Depends on how crazy they are, but almost certainly yes. Better question is, what about nines or ace-jack? Is game theory optimal exploitable? No, that is the definition of game theory optimal. However, the optimal strategy, the optimal, not game theory optimal, the optimal strategy against most players is very exploitable because you are playing an exploitative strategy. Like I'm just telling you to play against maniacs, right? Don't raise them with the nuts on the flop and the turn because they're going to fold. If they know your calling range is really, really strong, what should they do? easy. They should stop bluffing. The problem is, is they're maniacs and they don't know how to stop bluffing. So if they just stop bluffing, they will demolish you. Imagine they just only value that. And your idea is I'm going to call this guy a lot. You are going to get crushed, 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 crushed. It's not even close. But the optimal strategy is someone who will not adjust or is adjusting very slowly is to maximally exploit them. But game theory optimal is one specific strategy that is thought to be optimal against someone else who's playing optimally, which in turn means that if your opponent's not playing optimally, they will be losing some amount of money. The question is how much. Uh, usually it's going to, well, it will be way less than if you're exploiting them. The donkeys means that they are sucking out. Well, listen, if people are getting lucky, then you should not really care. I think a lot of people care a lot about who's getting lucky and who's winning and losing in a specific session. But, I mean, just imagine a game where everybody's going all in every hand. The luckiest player is going to win, Right? And if you're playing small six games and there are, let's say, three maniacs who are just really getting after it, well, one out of the three is probably going to run a little bit hot, right? And they're going to win some hands. The other two are going to go broke and leave, or maybe they keep rebuying, who knows? But um, it's not uncommon in small six games for people to come with one or two buy-ins, and if they run hot without one or two buy-ins, they keep playing. And that's the people you are seeing having good success, right? But in reality, they lose one or two buy-ins every single day besides once or twice a month or once every 10 or 15 or 20 sessions, and because of that, they lose money long-term. It's the same thing in tournaments, right? A lot of people sensationalize people who will run really hot in tournaments, and then you look at their play, and you're like, this person's just getting ridiculously lucky. And sometimes that happens. People get lucky. That's part of the game. 
If you're good at reads, you can crush a GTO robot. What if we're playing online? What if the opponent has no tells? You may say, well, everyone has tells. But um, quite often, again, you don't exactly know what's going on. But uh, yes, in the ideal world, if you could literally tell the difference in people's pulses, if you could tell the difference in their blinking patterns and the way they put the chips in the pot, et cetera, et cetera, I'm very confident you could deduce exactly what things mean. The problem is they're very subconscious. Like if someone puts in chips like this, then they put them in like, this, I try to do the exact same thing. If they try to do the exact same thing and they're pretty good at it, or they're just slightly off, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. That's the, that's the thing. Is a lot of good players just don't give off stuff. What tournament should you be playing if you have a 100k bankroll? That probably depends on your skill level. Read jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll for more advice on that. Um, 100k is a big amount, though. You can easily play 1k is no problem if you're happy moving down if it goes poorly. And, you know, to be fair, some people who have 100k are, are happy to are uh, skilled enough to play those. I would also tell you to um, ask how you got the money, right? If you just got it from working a job, then that doesn't say anything about your skill level. If you got it from grinding all the way up slowly, then you're probably pretty good, right? If you got 100K by playing a $10 tournament online and you want it for 100K, well, that doesn't mean you should be playing 1Ks, right? Because you're not skilled enough. It's very important to realize that. Um, uh, Scarmaker, the guy who credited me with teaching him a lot, and I didn't even really know it, um, he took third place in the party poker, 10 million guarantee, 20 million guarantee? 10 million guarantee, 20 million, I don't remember which one it was. They had a big guarantee, and um, he took third for like one point, how much million was it? 1.3 million, he turned $5 into 1.3 million, and he's smart enough to realize, okay, I'm a $5 tournament player, I have $1.3 million now, I probably don't need to be jumping into 10Ks. But a lot of people are not that smart. They think, ooh, 1.3 million, let me play the 100Ks. I'm in. And obviously that's ridiculous. When you have a table maniac, table captain maniac, just wait for them to make a mistake. Well, they're making mistakes left and right, so just play good cards. Should you balance your range in small and medium stakes tournaments? Depends on, the, on who you're against, right? The buy-in level is irrelevant. What matters is who you're against. In general, there's still decent players in small and middle stakes tournaments, just not as many. Do tournament strategies work good in cash games? If you play fundamentally sound, deep stacked in a tournament, you're going to be perfectly fine in cash games. When's the GTO book coming out? March. Not March. Um, June or July. What if you don't get good cards against the Maniac? You sit there and you fold because it doesn't cost you anything. If you're playing a cash game and you get no cards, it costs you a big blind and a half per orbit, like nothing. You sit there. You be patient. You're only supposed to be playing 10 or 15% of hands against them anyway, so you could easily go four or five orbits without getting cards. That's just part of the game. Don't be impatient. You have to have discipline. Uh, let's see. What site can you play on outside of New Jersey and Nevada? Unregulated ones? <laughs> if you want to put money on a site and understand you're probably not going to get it back some portion of the time, there are definitely sites out there. But I don't play on them because I like getting my money back. How do you prevent the maniacs from scooping all the pots when nobody has anything? You don't. That's the thing, Sam. You don't have to prevent that. You have to, instead, lower your requirements for playable hands, right? Like I just said a minute ago, like middle pair is good. Check call middle pair. And also, it's fine if the maniac beats the other people. You don't really care about that, right? That's irrelevant. What matters is, are, is the maniac beating you? And also, if the maniac is... If everyone's playing well against the Maniac, the Maniac will scoop all the pots where everyone has nothing, but they're going to lose so much on the hands that they lose that that makes up for more than the amounts they win whenever, um, whenever everybody folds. Let's see. If you have a Maniac image but your hands are at the top of your range, how do you adjust so players quit calling light? Oh, so you're saying if um, you've been just particularly aggressive because you've had good cards... Um, you just perhaps need to play a little bit tighter, right? If people are going to be calling you light, stop bluffing quite so much. Will you rail me if you make the final table this summer? If I'm there, sure. What about in a tournament against the Maniac if you don't get good cards? You sit there and you fold and you be patient. And also realize you don't have to play against specifically the Maniac. And in tournaments, it's actually pretty nice because if you have 20 big blinds, let's say, and the Maniac raises cutoff and you're on the button or small blind or big blind, just jam all in really wide with a blocker, like a king four offsuit blocker. Because the, the king is good enough. It's a blocker. And you know the Maniac is going to fold a lot. And then if the Maniac is going to call you with all sorts of junk, well, King, King 4 is often in not such terrible shape. 
So get some... Um, Get it out of your mind that bad cards are a justification for just blinding out. They're not. Um, yes, they're probably going to lose when you get bad cards. You're supposed to lose when you get bad cards. And that's okay, because you're not going to get bad cards all the time, right? Let's see. Any plans on updating the cash game book? Um... We have the GTO book coming out in the near future, and it definitely discusses deep stack play. So that'll be exciting. It's with Michael Acevedo. And there may be plans to update other books. We'll see. We'll see. Can't, can't spoil that yet. That's, that's another year or two down the road. I will say, my first book came out eight years ago. Ten-year anniversary is coming up. Seems like a good time to update it, right? It may almost be finished already. <laughs> All right, let's see. You run into trouble playing cash, raising three betting and missing flops. Um, any fix? Yes, John, you need to go to pokercoaching.com and sign up and then go through all of the past homework challenges. We will easily fix that problem. You're probably playing too aggressively. You need to be doing more checking. If you're betting with all of your garbage, you have too much garbage. So you're easy to play against. If you, your range is all garbage or mostly garbage or just even a little too much garbage, you're going to get crushed by players who are decent. Uh, let's see. You prefer the Maniac to beat the other players, just more chips for you to get later. Yeah, in a tournament, I think maybe what someone was asking there was that, say you're playing at a table and the Maniac's winning every pot from everyone else and you're beating the Maniac. That's fine because you're beating the Maniac, right? That, the Maniac's just beating everyone else and then giving it all to you in one big chunk. It's fantastic. I remember in the World Series main event one time, I had this guy to my left who was like legitimately main, um, a legitimate Maniac. He was from Argentina. And remember I had I, I like was just sitting there playing tightly. He was crushing everyone, just getting hit by the deck. And I slow played aces hard. I raised, he three bet. I called. Flop came, um, what was it? It was like jack eight, jack eight two. I checked, he bet, I called. Turn was a nine. Jack eight, no, jack eight two seven. Jack eight two seven. I checked, he bet, I went all in for like 2.3 times his amount. He bet way too big. And he like snap called me. I'm like, oh, I must be out. And then he showed up with 10 three offsuit for a gut shot. And um, he didn't get there. <laughs> so, yeah, against people like that, just, life's easy, right? You're going to be in Vegas for two terms. I would love to get lunch together. I'm only going out for the World Series of Poker at the very beginning, in which case I'm going to be super busy playing World Poker Tour Tournament Champions, so not getting lunch with anyone. And then during the main event, right before that, I'll be there, I think, two or three days before the main event, and we will definitely have a big group breakfast before one of the tournaments. I'm trying to find ways to get it all in good, so no small ball. Jasper, you're completely misunderstanding what we're talking about. We are discussing how to play against players who force you to play big pots. I'm not trying to play big pots, but the Maniacs want to play big pots, and they want to play it with a range that's too wide. Against players who are weak and passive, you need to be raising to small amounts, continuation betting to small amounts, and then when they play back at you, you just fold. So against them, yes, we're playing small pots. People get it, man, where do people find these terms? And they try to apply them to everything, like changing gears and small ball and you have to play against your particular opponents right if your opponents make the mistake of playing too large of pots with garbage you're playing large pots don't sit there and fold and be a nit because that's how they beat you right if you're playing against super nits and they decide to raise you on the turn fold everything besides the nuts because they have the nuts right so don't think that you can just make up some term and then apply it across the board to all strategies because that's not how poker works Oh, don't get too excited. The shirt is sweet. Yes, I had it made. I have uh, three or four of them. They cost like 80 bucks a piece. We have to figure out how to make them cheap. I mean, you don't get good cards. You look for situations to exploit. Yeah, three bet, four bet. That's exactly what you need to be doing. You're going to be playing the Big 50. Really hope to meet you there. I will not be there during the Big 50. Sorry. Come play in Texas. Everyone's a maniac. Yeah, you're going to find in most places without... Regular casinos, most players are maniacs. Am I playing all no limit events? I don't know, probably. Um, I know there's a few half and half no limit holding PLO events that make logical sense to play. Do you play pocket nines and pocket sixes the same preflop facing an open race in early position? Um, I call with most of them. Do I three bet with fives? Usually not. 
Three betting with the lower pairs is very good if your opponents are very good. It's very bad if your opponents are very bad because set mining is very, 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 very valuable. Clem Slate today, number 8001. Yeah, you showed up late. You should sell the shirt on your site. See, this is the problem. Um, a lot of content creators out there don't actually create valuable content. They create entertainment for people who don't want to learn. Fortunately, I create valuable content and people are happy to pay me for the valuable content. And online content requires literally no stock, right? I don't have to have a thousand shirts. I don't have to deal with that. And I don't really want to be in the shirt selling business because that's a lot of work. Now, of course, we could find a um, relationship with some drop shipper where they print them and ship them and or make them and ship them. But then I have to ask, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and I don't see a whole lot of upside. That's really what it amounts to, right? If you tell me I'll make a shirt store and make 5,000 a year, I mean, maybe I'm just supposed to do it. But my goal is to make you good at poker. That said, um, we are tr actively trying to figure out how to get hats and shirts made. Um, the problem is, is I want to give the shirts away for free. I don't, I'm not trying to sell the shirts. I want to give the shirts to people who sign up to poker coaching, right? So if you're signed up to poker coaching and you're paying me $40 a month or you're being uh you know getting it for 75 percent off on our discount like we have now pokercoaching.com slash new year well then we're happy to give you a shirt so we have to figure out a way to get that made but i'm not trying to sit here and, and charge for shirts it seems seems a little bit crazy crazy to me at least because we add value to all of you and you say yes it's good advertisement yes it is good advertisement but it's a lot of work it's you have to understand everyone do, everyone thinks i have infinite time I know I get a lot done, and, but I really have no time. And I have a team. I have, I have what, six, six or seven people who work with me now. And they don't have time. We're all busy. But that is on our to-do list. We have someone working on our social media now, and that is one of his tasks. So the shirts we wanted are currently back-ordered, because that's how this stuff works. And um, it'll get done eventually. Be patient. I made these for myself, though, because they're nice. Relatively nice, at least. These are the nicest ones I could find. Turns out a lot of the shirts that people get printed are really crappy. And um, I don't want to get crappy shirts. Do you think limp calling with a 10 big blind raise with twos is generally acceptable? No. Fold. You wouldn't want a hat that says poker coaching because they know you get coached. That's exactly right. Maybe a logo that isn't as recognizable unless you know. Well, then it's not very good marketing, is it, Demonte? <laughs> You'd buy a hat to support me. Well, thank you. I'd rather you buy a poker training product and get good and support me. If having less shirt, fewer shirts means you get more video content, then I can keep the shirts. Yeah, that's, that's generally my view as well. Would it be confusing to be a part of two different poker coaching sites? Would it, does it make sense to sign up to multiple training sites? I don't even necessarily view it like that. Is it confusing to study two, how two different players play? And the answer is it may be. You're going to find that a lot of the best players play pretty similarly, though, within reason, um, depending on exactly what they're trying to teach you to do, right? And I don't think it's confusing. I mean, I sign up to lots and lots of poker training sites, and I think it's highly valuable because I learn a lot from it. I think you have to be careful with just trying to copy what someone does and instead try to learn how to play well. Those are very different things. Just copying someone... It'll work okay, but it's not going to work great. And I'm trying to teach you all to play great, which is why at poker coaching, I always have you tell me what you're going to do, not here's what I do and that's the definitive answer. And I know that I'm, I'm wrong sometimes, right? It's important to realize you're going to be wrong sometimes. You found me and Matt Berkey's way of teaching was more precise. Preciseness is important. If you win a bracelet with my hat on, do you get pokercoaching.com for life? Booked. There you go. Deal. Anyone here who um, wears a PokerCoaching.com hat or shirt at a World Series of Poker final table gets it for life. Go to China and get a $1 shirt. Plaza, this is exactly the problem. I don't want a crappy shirt. Um, so many sites out there and so many um, people make shirts that are just not good quality. And I'm trying to do good quality things. I think that's something that differentiates me from a lot of content creators out there is they are just trying to goof off and have fun. I'm trying to actually provide significant value. And 
I don't want to give you a shirt for free that's crappy. And I don't want you to buy, I definitely don't want you to buy a shirt that's crappy. And that's the problem is that whenever you put out a product that is yours, if it's crappy, it looks bad on you. And I'm not trying to put out a crappy product. Can you do a 10K challenge? I did that a long time ago. We've discussed it many times here. Let's see. Michael says you can do the shirts. Send me a message, we'll consider something. How do you rate the work of Doug Polk and other hand commentators? I don't really know. I don't watch a lot of other hand commentators. I'm sure it's fine. Let's see. Use my tournament knowledge and Bart Hansen's knowledge for cash game. Yes, I, I, I think Bart Hansen's site is great. I have watched a lot of Bart Hansen's videos, and he's very, very good at beating players who have mistakes in their game. I'm looking for a quality shirt printer. I don't even want the shirts printed. I want the shirts stitched. This is stitched on here, right? This is not printed. I'm not trying to have something printed. I need nice stuff, right? That's why the shirt costs 80 bucks. <laughs> because it's nice. All right. We don't want printed. You don't want printed stuff because printed stuff gets faded really easily. It's often not great quality. Sometimes it'll just straight fall off. Again, if you put out a product, your name is attached to it. If you put out something of bad quality, people will assume you put out bad quality things. I do not want to do that, especially on something like a shirt that I have literally no control over. World Series of Poker Sitting goes, which casino do I recommend? I think the only one that has them are um, the, the Rio. All right. What was my bankroll when I first started playing? $50. I never really went to pro. I never viewed it like that. I had a job. I actually had two jobs when I first started playing poker. One at a comic book store, one at an airport fueling airplanes. And I was also going to college. And I was playing poker. And inevitably, I turned the $50, or eventually, not inevitably, <laughs> eventually, I turned the $50 into, I don't know, about $150,000 before I quit my two $10 an hour jobs. Then a little while later, I quit college and then just kept playing a lot of poker. So I never really thought, okay, I'm doing it today. I'm going pro. I think... I think a lot of people, quote unquote, go pro without a real plan in place and without any sort of actual stability. And it's a gigantic mistake. I have an article out there. Should you go pro? I think it's on my web, on my blog, jonathanlillipoker.com. And um, I got a lot of flack for it because I think a lot of people said I was trying to dampen people's dreams or something like that. And I'm not. I'm just trying to give you all a realistic expectation of what's going to happen. Um, quite often, people really overestimate their win rate. Fortunately, I didn't do that because I was playing online and I had tons and tons of data. I was playing 3,000 sit and goes a month back then. And I did that for about a year. So I played 36,000 sit and goes before I even considered quitting my $10 an hour job. And I had 150K in the bank or whatever it was. And that's plenty of money for a 19 year old kid. And I didn't spend any money, right? That's, that's, how, you, that's how you go pro and like never, ever, ever fail. And that's what all my friends did. And none of them have ever failed. Who'd have thought? What casino did I play at? I was 18 or 19 years old when I was playing. The only time I ever played at a casino consistently was at Bellagio when I was 22, 23. I played there 12 hours a day every day. You love what I do. <laughs> my heart, it's clear. His heart is in it and it is clear. I do my best. I try to put out good quality. I do. What was my $10 an hour job? Working at the airport and working at a comic book store. Getting on a, if you're playing a one-two cash game on Poker Go, what's a good amount to sit down with? It doesn't really matter. So you never went broke with the, the 50. No, I played, I played a 25 cent, 50 cent limit when I first started. No limit was not really a thing back then. Am I going back to college? Absolutely not. Um, but no, I never busted the $50. A lot of my friends did the same thing. They started with a relatively small amount. They kept good bankroll management because they had studied way before they ever played. I want to make this clear. I'd already read like 15 poker books. There were no training sites back then. I read every poker book on the market I could about limit holding because that was the main game. I knew I needed to keep at least a decent bankroll. I was willing to deposit more if I, if I lost, but I, I didn't. I kept 100 bets for the first few limits, and I started keeping 300 bets and got up to 3060, then moved to sit and goes because I thought those would be better. Did you know that a full time pro even existed? Yes, I did. I read plenty of books. Used to collect all number one comics. Seems like a, an expensive habit. 
The vast majority of people should not go pro. Yes. Even if they could make it, you would not want to do it. It seems stressful. It's not really stressful if you keep a big bankroll and you know your win rates. The thing is, a lot of a lot of people do the exact opposite. They don't know their win rates and they don't keep a big bankroll and also they don't put in enough volume. Or if they do, they're not really doing it with um, the right mindset. A lot of pros make 50 to 75K. Again, what is a pro, right? 50 to 75K is actually pretty good. I would say a lot of pros out there make like 10K or 20K. How do you handle a massive downswing? You don't worry about it because it's irrelevant. If you know your win rates, you have the proper bankroll, you go and every time you play, you know you make X amount of equity. If you care about downswings, play cash games. There's way fewer downswings in cash games. And um, you can find games that are very soft to where you know the math behind it, right? Do the math, know what a bad downswing looks like. If it's somehow worse than this, that means you're probably not as good as you think you are. And always, always, if you're going pro, assume you make about as half as much as you think you're gonna make. Let's see. When I played at Bellagio, what blinds did I play? 5, 10, and 10, 20. What league did I plug? I used to play Ace-X all the time. That was really bad. How are the Vegas games? Super soft. They're still super soft. Um, there's zero stress if you get a good job and have poker making money as a hobby. Yeah. How many hobbies make money? I play Magic the Gathering. I think I'm making money on this. It's more of an investment thing, but we're locking it up for the long term. Um, are there more opportunities to make dollars in PLO? We discussed PLO in the past. I think it's quite a bad thing to do professionally because variance is through the roof. While some pros make little money. Again, Johnny, what is a pro? I mean, in theory, I've had years where I've lost money. Does that mean I was, was I not a pro those years? That happens. You have tournament hand charts. They're coming soon. But we discussed this uh, yesterday. Or no, on Monday. So, uh, Ryan, go back, or Michael, go back and watch that. Every time you reread a book, you learn, one of my books, you learn something new. Good. Yasa says you had $50 on party, you started with $10 sit and goes. You lasted two days. Yeah, that's how it goes. If you keep five buy-ins, you'll last about two days. If I were to retire and pursue something else, what location would I move to where I could play? Oh, wait, let's see. If, you were, if I was about to retire to pursue poker, I see. Um, where would I go to particularly? Where would I go to? Where would Jonathan Little go to? I'd probably just go back to Vegas. I like Vegas. Um, but I think it's because of nostalgia. Yeah, it's because of nostalgia. Um, where would I go to, though? I think I would probably go to Florida, like the Miami area. They have very good games there. It's probably where I would go. The weather's decently nice. I don't really mind the heat so much. I don't think I'd want to go to L.A. I don't like traffic. Your, your, real, your only good options, though, by the way, are Vegas, L.A., Florida, maybe now the um, Washington, D.C. area, that, that rough area is reasonable. You don't really have very many good options. You need to be able to play like 5, 10 or higher every day if you want to make significant money. What's a realistic expectation? Real, I, mean, I don't even know what that question is, Mazi. You need to figure out that you're going to have a lot of variance, and variance is normal in tournaments. What's my favorite Magic deck? Right now I'm playing Grixis, Delver, and Legacy, and in Vintage, it's either Paradoxical Outcome, with Mentors usually, with the Mentor, only one Mentor now, or Dark Petition Storm, it's fun. I have a Magic the Gathering um, Instagram page for all those on Instagram, it's called Daily Magic Muse. Every day, I post a fun Magic the Gathering card, so go check that out. I've looked at the structure sheets. I don't really care about the structure sheets. The structure sheets. Um, structures are fairly irrelevant in my mind. They're all comparable enough. Some are better than others, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. If you're playing a one-day tournament, you know there's going to be tons of variance. If you're playing a five-day tournament, you know there's not going to be very much variance. Lost your entire bankroll when you were on tilt. Yeah, don't do that. Please advise you on how to build it back from scratch. Start small, be disciplined. And most people lack discipline. You must be disciplined. Oh, let's see. Thanks for sharing all the mindset ideas. You're very welcome, Louis Philippe. If you treat poker as a hobby, there's less pressure on you to make it. Yeah, I always uh, treated poker very professionally in my mind. And that's because I want, I thought like, I mean, I always, I take, treat everything I do professionally. I'm not trying to be bad at stuff. If I'm going to devote a significant amount of time to anything, I'm going to try to be good at it. I don't see a, a lot of value in wasting time. Favorite deck, I just told you. 
Grixis Delver and Legacy. Paradoxical Out. That's just has to be Paradoxical Outcome and, and Vintage. You don't like it, but you live in New York City. LOL. I don't have a problem with New York City. I don't really care where I live. Also, my wife lives here, and my wife has a job. I like my wife better than I like any city. But yes, follow my Instagram account, Daily Magic Muse, M U S C. When's my next tournament? I don't know. <laughs> I just had a baby. I have a, how old is he? Seven weeks old now. And um, my next tournament I know I'm going to go to for sure is the ARIA WPT in May and the World Poker Tour Tournament of Champions in May. And I think there's a 5K right at the beginning of the World Series and a 10K Bounty Turbo All In Fest. So those will be my next tournaments for sure. There's a chance you may go somewhere in March, probably not. Um, but that's it. When did I begin coaching? Why slash how did I get into it? I hired a coach right off the bat when I first started playing poker. Once I got a hold of any amount of money, I hired a guy named Bill Seymour, who owned a site called PokerCoaching.com. Sound familiar? Um, he helped me a lot. I learned a ton from him. And he was he was a great poker coach. He's had his hands in all sorts of people you know, like Bill Ivey, Dan Negreanu, people like this. He's helped all these players whenever they were young, and he helped me a lot. So I, I always knew the value of coaching. And once I realized I was actually good and had skills to use to help people, I started helping them because you pay it forward, you know? Do I only play at the Rio or do I play at other places? Depends on exactly what the strategies are. Um, this summer, I'm probably going to play mostly at the Rio or Aria. How's the wife doing? Wife's doing great. You're new to tournaments, you feel like an amateur sometimes in your mindset to make the money. What percentage of tournaments should you be cashing in? Roughly the percentage that you should be cashing in. If you're one in, like say they pay 15%, you should cash about 15%. Maybe a little bit more. Cashing is pretty irrelevant. What's relevant is winning. Go read jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll. You play the World Series all summer. Not since I've had kids. Doesn't seem responsible to me. Also, the World Series of Poker isn't actually that profitable if you're not playing the biggest tournaments every day and the problem in vegas is a lot of the biggest tournaments are mixed games and i don't really play mixed games and i realize I'm, i have no skills there right and therefore you play what fifteen hundred dollar tournaments where you're going to make six hundred dollars a day which is fine you know six hundred dollars a day is fine but there's infinite variance which is again not great for a pro and i can make more than six hundred dollars a day sitting at home doing things like a little coffee and writing articles and writing books and working on pokercoaching.com so it's about priorities. I'm gonna go play the very beginning when the stuff is big. I'm gonna go play the very end when stuff is big. Skip all the small stuff in the middle. Any magic tournaments? I'm thinking about going and playing on Mondays every once in a while at a place called The Geekery. <laughs> uh, it's not so far away from me here in New York City. They have Legacy on Mondays. None of the other players have mixed game skills either. That's not true actually. If you look at the um, ending few levels of a lot of the mixed game tournaments, you're gonna find that it's the same people on a regular basis. You don't want to be playing high six tournaments against the same people who make deep runs on a regular basis. They're like literally the best players in the world who've been playing these games their whole life. Often they're specialists. Do I really, am I really egotistical enough to think that I can go play something like seven card stud against people who've been playing it forever with only studying for six months or a year? Seems absurd. Would you have benefited more from private coaching? I did get private coaching. Yes, by far. That was by far the most useful thing I've done, which is why I made PokerCoaching.com for all of you, which is essentially like private coaching because the quizzes have me essentially standing over your shoulder and giving you my advice on every spot that you play. And also the homework challenges, um, I, get, I answer everyone's question. Me personally, I answer everyone's question. It is private coaching. Speaking of that, we're having a webinar tonight at 8 p.m. If you're not on my email list, email support at PokerCoaching.com. Say so you want to be in the webinar tonight where we are going to dissect how to play your whole range against the maniac when they check raise you on the flop so check it out it's gonna be a lot of fun we will be back on um friday 9 a.m eastern time are you able to watch the replays of a little coffee yes they are available on youtube youtube.com slash float the turn they're also on twitch and my videos so that's gonna be it for today i hope everyone had a great day discussing maniacs and t-shirts and all this other stuff. Good luck. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. And I'll see you all in the webinar tonight at 8 p.m.